Welcome to Fusion News, brought to you by the Fusion Industry Association. My name is Jeff Peachman, and I'll be your host today. I'm a graduate student at the University of Washington studying flow stabilized Z pinches. Let's get right into our top stories. One, physicists overcome two key operating hurdles in fusion reactions. Two, fusion record set for tungsten tokamak west. Three, UK to launch search for industry partners to develop prototype fusion energy plant. Four, G7 puts fusion forward at the Climate, Energy, and Environment Ministers meeting. And of course, there's a lot of bonus stories at the end. One, physicists overcome two key operating hurdles in fusion reactions. Fundamentally, a fusion power plant compresses and heats fusion fuels to produce energy. To produce more energy than we consume, the fuel needs to be dense enough and hot enough for long enough. The power output of a fusion power plant depends on the plasma density squared, so it's important to have high density. Back in the 1980s, a team of researchers led by Martin Greenwald looked at data from many different tokamaks, and they recognized what is now called the Greenwald limit. This is a very simple equation, which is rare in plasma physics, but it's a very simple equation which states that the maximum density that you can get depends only on how much current is moving through the plasma divided by the cross-sectional area of the tokamak. If you go beyond this limit, the plasma tends to become unstable. And so for many years, tokamaks have been designed with this limit in mind. The important news today is that a recent experiment went well beyond the Greenwald limit while maintaining good confinement. At the D3D tokamak in San Diego, they exceeded the Greenwald limit by over 20%. Unlike previous experiments, they also achieved excellent confinement. In fact, their confinement was better than we're expecting at ITER, which is the huge tokamak being built in South France. At D3D, they managed to pull this off for a solid 2.2 seconds, which is much longer than the time scale of all the physics going on. It's a long time in the physics world. So how did they achieve this? In the end, they achieved a scenario they call high poloidal beta. This reduced the density near the edge of the plasma, which is believed to be the source of many plasma instabilities. One of the advantages of this configuration is that it maximizes a self-generated plasma current called the bootstrap current. This means less current needs to be supplied externally, which then means that tokamaks can be cheaper to run. So higher density and less external current, win-win. This result expands the design space for future experiments and power plants. They can either produce more power with the same current or the same power with less current than before. The latter case means a very low probability of disruption, which can increase reliability. So future designers have more options and commercial fusion just got one step closer to reality. Two, fusion record set for tungsten tokamak west. West is a tokamak located in France, only a few miles from the site of Eater, and it has walls made out of tungsten. This makes it different from most other tokamaks which have graphite walls. Graphite can actually withstand higher temperatures than tungsten, but it also absorbs fusion fuels like deuterium and tritium. Now tritium is very rare and we want to be able to use every bit of tritium that we can get, so the wall material had a change. But this creates a new problem. Plasma knocks tiny amounts of tungsten off of the walls and contaminates the plasma. The tungsten atoms have a large number of electrons and these, con these contaminants become ionized and then they greatly increase the electron density. And that's a big problem because all of those electrons, as they're moving around, they're radiating energy. And when they do that, they cool the plasma down. So with tungsten walls, it's hard to reach the same performance that we could with graphite. West set a new record for a tungsten clad tokamak. It ran for six minutes at a temperature of 50 million degrees C, which is about 4 keV for the plasma folks in the audience. This measurement was taken using a new technique by the Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory, which measures X-ray radiation from the plasma over many different cords, which are like lines through the plasma. It not only measures the temperature, but it also measures the density of the impurities, such as that tungsten that comes off the walls. This helps researchers understand how that tungsten is transported off the walls, 
which may minimize the impurities in the future. In summary, we have a new record with new walls and new ways of measuring plasma. And all of these are very important incremental advances on the road towards fusion energy. Three, the UK to launch search for industry partners to develop prototype fusion energy plant. The UK government is building a fusion pilot power plant called the Spherical Tokamak for Energy Production, or STEP. They plan to build it at West Burton, the site of a former coal-fired power plant in Nottinghamshire. I previously covered why converting a coal power plant to a fusion power plant is a great idea. Most of the infrastructure that you need to create and distribute that power already exists, which greatly reduces your costs and the amount of time it takes to construct your power plant. This is why FIA member Type 1 Energy is doing this in Tennessee, and why another FIA member, ZAP Energy, is studying this in Washington State. The UK is contracting with commercial enterprises to build STEP, and they plan a competition to ultimately select one company to oversee construction and another to handle engineering. The partnership will be led by UK Industrial Fusion Solutions, which is a government-owned company that partners with the UK Atomic Energy Authority, which will lend its expertise in fusion physics to the program. The competition will kick off on May 22nd, with selections made in late 2025 or 2026. We'll obviously be watching this very closely and we'll keep you up to date. Four, G7 puts fusion forward at the Climate, Energy, and Environment Ministers meeting. The G7 summit will be held in Italy this year, bringing together heads of state from Canada, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, the UK, and the USA. Leading up to the summit, there are many meetings between G7 ministers from these countries who work on specialized topics. On April 29th and the 30th, ministers met to discuss climate, energy, and the environment, and they released a communique which identifies actions which they believe their countries need to take on many different topics, including fusion energy. The G7 members recognize that fusion energy has the potential to provide a lasting solution to climate change and energy security. So they've agreed to establish a G7 working group on fusion energy and a G7 exchange to promote a coordinated approach to regulations between the countries. They believe that regulations should ensure a high level of safety, but be proportionate to the relatively low risks of fusion technology. On this channel, we've talked a lot about the importance of getting the regulations right for fusion. It's extremely important that the regulatory framework is in place to give some certainty to the rapidly growing fusion energy industry. The US and UK led the world by proactively passing laws and regulations to ensure that fusion is treated separately from fission in a manner that protects the public while encouraging innovation. But the transition to low carbon energy sources is a global endeavor and not just in the US and UK. So I'm very excited about this progress at the G7. A coordinated approach to regulations could mean that a fusion power plant designed in one country can be deployed in another country, which means fusion can be rolled out quickly. That was our last major story, but I do have three bonus stories for you. The first is that last week was Fusion Energy Week. This is where organizations around the United States host events about fusion. These included lab tours, seminars, networking events, educational events, or in some cases, just meetups for donuts or beer. If you missed it, check out the links below and get it on your calendar for next year. Next is a YouTube video called The Latest Developments in Fusion Energy. Plasma physicists working on JET, ITER, and NIF show how these fusion experiments work and some of the latest results in the field. And finally, there's a short clip from Commonwealth Fusion Systems, who recently held a company event called Fusion Land. It looked like a really fun and wild party, and it shows that fusion scientists and engineers know how to have a lot of fun. That's all the fusion news for this week. I hope you enjoyed the stories, and if you did, hit like and subscribe. Also, check out the descriptions for links to all the stories. And once again, I'm Jeff Peachman, and thanks for joining me.